right, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about elections and capitalism in the U.S. Um, but first, I'm going to take you back to 2008. Okay, so come with me here. Do uh, you guys remember 2008? Something historic did happen that year. It was the first time in our country's 220 years of white male presidents that an African American man was elected to the highest office in the nation. Obama's election broke a streak that spanned 43 administrations. This is extremely profound, especially for the approximately 41 million African Americans in this country. For four centuries, we have suffered enslavement, Jim Crow segregation, lynch mob terror, and racist discrimination manifested in countless ways. The fact is that racism against African Americans and other oppressed nationalities has in reality been far more integral to the American way than has anything truly resembling democracy. In a way, Obama's victory showed us how much progress the black liberation struggle and its legacy has made in eroding white supremacy in this country. So do you remember that day on January 20th, 2009, when Obama took office and two to three million people filled the, wall, the mall in Washington? People were crying and cheering and waving goodbye to Bush's helicopter. It was, it's true. It was euphoria all over the country. There was a widespread feeling of joy. People, many were so understandably relieved, believing that since Bush, the Bush years were over, that real change was now going to come. And if you think about it, really at that point, Obama could have done anything. If he had immediately called out his supporters, called on those two to three million people and the countless others across the country to march for jobs or in support of a health care bill, a real single payer health care plan, they would have turned out in droves. There's no telling what could have been accomplished. So the question is, why did he do it? Because the office of president in this country comes with a job description, a very specific job description. And that job description is CEO of the capitalist ruling class, charged with protecting and expanding their interests. The president is put in office specifically to protect a system of extreme and growing poverty among the working class and extreme wealth for the capitalists who accumulate their fortunes from the labor of working people. The capitalist state perpetuates racism, police repression, mass incarceration, and endless war. We are taught, and many people believe, that the presidential election is the process of selecting the next leader of our country, and that the country includes all of us. But in reality, our democracy is a democracy by, of, and for the rich. You get about as much democracy as you can buy. In any election, if you look through the top 100 co contributors to either candidate, one can see that with the exception of a handful of labor unions, the chief campaign co contributors make up the lion's share of the top 100 of the Fortune 500. This election cycle is no different. As of June of this year, candidates for the two major capitalist parties have raised more than 100 million in combined campaign funds. Though they're wealthy individually, there's simply no way that a candidate could raise those kind of funds without the support of some sector of the ruling class. Campaign costs for both sides are expected to exceed $2 billion in 2012. So why even have an election? We can see certainly the capitalist class views the election as important. The question is why? Well, thinking back to 2008, can you imagine what would have happened if McCain, who everyone saw as an extension of the hated Bush regime, had won the last election? Imagine if McCain alone had presided over the bailout, the largest transfer of wealth in human history, and delivered trillions of tax dollars to his friends on Wall Street. Imagine if McCain had announced that the recession is over while millions were losing their homes and the unemployment rates were soaring. Imagine if it were McCain in the depths of the economic crisis who was extending tax cuts to the very wealthy. What if McCain had made nearly a trillion dollars in cuts to education, housing, health care, transportation, environmental protection, and an assortment of social programs and services that were already stretched thin? What if, if, imagine if a Republican president had deported one million undocumented immigrants more than in the previous eight years combined? if he had tripled the number of troops deployed to Afghanistan, bombed Pakistan, and launched a new imperialist war of aggression in Libya, assassinating Libya's leader and destroying its infrastructure. How would the anti-war movement have responded? How would labor unions respond? How would oppressed African-American communities who are experiencing an uptick in both unemployment and police violence have responded? How would the Million Strong Immigrant Rights Movement have responded? We all know there would have been mass mobilizations of a scope and militancy that would have put even the impressive Occupy movement to shame. It would have been painfully obvious to all the affected sectors of society that they must fight to defend their interests. We know this, and so does the ruling class. That's why, in the last big election cycle, 71% of campaign contributions from the big banks and other finance capitalists went to Obama. These interests, who sit at the very top of the pyramid of capitalist society, 
have traditionally tended to direct most of their contributions to the Republicans. The Democrat and Republicans are the Democrats and Republicans are both capitalist parties, but they're not identical. The Democrats are perceived as friends of the working class, though the last four years have proven that illusion to be quite thin. But still, in 2008, when the capitalist economic crisis was just beginning to unfold, the ruling class correctly calculated that a popular Democrat and African American would serve as a better instrument for quelling rebellion from the masses. They knew that in these times, labor unions and African Americans, the very same groups who would be leading the struggle if these attacks were carried out by Republicans, would be stymied by loyalty to the president. They were correct. The election of Barack Obama and the circus of the campaign cycle, which broke records for funds raised, did help stave off the protests of the people suffering the most, at least for a little while. Democracy in capitalist society is the preferred form of rule precisely because it conceals the nature of this rule. It allows them to periodically change their image and give the appearance of choice while carrying out the same program of class warfare. It keeps the exploited sectors of society from drawing the revolutionary conclusions needed to overthrow it. Instead of fighting the system, many oppressed people throw their weight behind the Democrats, who are inaccurately perceived as many, uh, by many as the party of the people. When the Democrats do nothing to affect the status quo, many get disillusioned and shift back to the Republicans or stop voting altogether. This happened in 2010 during the midterm elections, when the wake of the ruling class shifted back to the Republicans who made huge gains in Congress. It was the most expensive midterm election in history, costing over $4 billion. During that election, many of the people, people of color and poor and working people, who had turned out in huge numbers to elect Obama president, just set out that election entirely. In fact, that is the real value from the point of view of the capitalist ruling class of having a two-party, but no more than two-party system. It conveys the illusion of democracy and choice while serving to protect at all times the interests of those who hold the real power. And every four years, this cycle can repeat itself again. So basically, what I'm saying is the capitalist electoral system is a sham. It is a system rigged to ensure the domination of the tiny ruling class of Wall Street bankers corporations, and big business owners over the vast majority of the people in the United States, the working class. Think about it. Us workers have the right to vote, but we don't have the right to vote on the basic decisions that most affect our lives. The unemployed, and there are 40 million unemployed people in this country right now, they have the right to vote every two or four years. The jobless have the right to vote for a politician, but they do not have the right to a job. People who are being foreclosed on, and 9 million families have been foreclosed on and threatened with foreclosure since 2008, they have the right to vote. Under capitalism, the people who are losing their homes have the right to vote for politicians, but they don't have a legal right to stay in their houses. Under the most democratic form of capitalism, and I'm not talking about a fascist form of capitalism or a police state or a military dictatorship, under democratic capitalism, the unemployed have the right to vote, the foreclosed and evicted have the right to vote, but like I said, neither has the right to a job or a home. If a plant is going to close down in a certain town, if they, the, the owners of that plant decide they can make a profit somewhere else, a bigger profit halfway around the world, and they're going to lay off thousands, and they're going to devastate that town, do the people who live in that town get to vote on whether or not that plant stays open? No. That right and these rights only belong to the capitalists, because they own the property, they own the corporations, and they own the banks. We get the right to elect a Republican or a Democrat, but both of these parties are nothing more than the expression of power, the undiluted power of the 1%. Virtually every election is a case of the working class going into the voting booth and voting for who will serve as our oppressors for the next two or four years. We as socialists call them bourgeois or capitalist elections, not as an insult or pejorative term, but as an objective reality. No matter if it's the Democrats or the Republicans who get the most votes, the capitalists win. So if that's the case, what's the role of the socialists in these elections? Why do we even participate? Because we believe in utilizing any and every arena of struggle. Millions will vote, and those who do not directly participate are forced to listen closely, because the corporate media focuses on the elections constantly. We as a party believe, as Lenin did, that with very few exceptions, any revolutionary party should utilize any and every opportunity to reach the working class. As a party of struggle, our priority is to be in the streets. Our priority is to be organizing, organizing at our schools, in our communities, and at our workplace, because that's where changes came about, come about in the past, and that's where it will come from in the future. It's always the struggle of the people. The Social Security Act of 1935, which provided Social Security for the elderly and unemployment insurance, insurance for those who lost their jobs, 
or the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or the Voting Rights Act of 1965, or any other progressive reform, including the eight-hour day, the right to public education, the right to form unions, all of these progressive developments came about because people struggled and fought for them and won. So with that in mind, I want to let you know that our intention when we enter the 2012 presidential and vice presidential, uh, sorry, vice presidential campaign is not to promote the idea that social change comes about because of the election of certain politicians. We don't believe that at all. We don't hold any illusions about the electoral system. We see it as one more way to reach out to the working class with our program, a program for real revolutionary change. We are entering the electoral arena to give voice to all of the struggles we are engaged in, in the streets, at the barricades, in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our communities. We will represent the unemployed, the foreclosed, the evicted. We will represent the students who can't pay their student loans. And we will raise the demand that the ill-begotten wealth should be seized and used to create a massive jobs program so every unemployed person can work. We will demand the seizure of assets and profits of the big banks. So that rather than using those fabulous fortunes for the already rich, we can provide free education and job training for all. We will demand the, ca the cancellation of all student loans. Student loan debt in this country has recently reached one trillion dollars. We will take the, the slogan of the Occupy movement, banks got bailed out, we got sold out, straight into the electoral arena. Instead of ba bailing out banks, we will demand an immediate mor moratorium and end to all foreclosures and evictions. We will demand amnesty and full rights for all immigrants because a worker is a worker regardless of their national origin and all workers deserve rights. We will demand an immediate end to the war in Afghanistan, a war that cost $120 billion this year, $330 million each day, a war that has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Afghan people, ruining the lives of thousands of US service members who've either been killed or suffered horrible physical and psychological wounds as a consequence of this needless war of aggression. As you can see, brothers and sisters, this is not a normal election campaign. The PSL is entering the election campaign, and I'm proud to be on the ticket with my comrade, Jody Osorio, to be a voice of the people and to bring the spirit of struggle absolutely everywhere that we can. We hope that you'll join with us in this campaign, participate, become a voice of the program, become a volunteer in spreading this message, and join with us in this exciting new period. All around the world, the people are rising up, brothers and sisters, and you know what? The capitalists say get back, we say fight back! back.